Bueno, pues reiteraros el agradecimiento por estar Once esta again, to emphasize uh, our thankfulness, our gratitude for having you here. Thanks uh, to La Casa Encendida for the fourth cycle. And special thanks uh, to Carolyn Steele for traveling from London to join us. It's a true pleasure to have her with us. Carolyn is a writer, um, an essay writer, a researcher, a professor in different universities. And over the course of the last years, she's specialized in analyzing in uh, the food system, especially the bonds between the city, the links between the city and food. In her first uh, book, uh, Hunger Cities, and the second book uh, that has been recently published, uh, which is Utopia. And uh, we wanted to combine the different elements, and we really thought that it was interesting to have her here in this cycle because we think that there will be no alternative society models that uh, do not go down a different path in terms of how to relate to food. And this is one of the things that uh, she tackles at Zootopia, uh, the fact that uh, we can change the food system uh, and change our world uh, from the environmental relationship and social perspectives in terms of habitat and in terms of the models, the urban models and the different settlements that we inhabit. And also together with Carolyn, we're going to hear from Nerea Moran. She's also a professor of the Higher Technical School of Architecture of Madrid. And for years, she's been researching the, the links between the city and the food system. She is a co-author of uh, the prologue of uh, uh, Hunger Cities uh, by Carolyn Steele. So it's really nice they can finally get together and uh, exchange uh, some reflections. And uh, firstly, we will hear from Carolyn for 45 uh, minutes approximately. And uh, she will probably inspire us with her reflections and ideas. And then Nerea will also, will also share a series of reflections, contributions, and maybe questions. Later, we will hear their exchange, their discussion. And uh, to wrap up, we will also open the floor to you. and. Uh, we will have an open mic. Uh, you can make suggestions, request uh, further clarity, if you will. And without further ado, Carolyn, take it away. Thank you so much. Um, but it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, thanks so much to Kois. Not only I discovered for inviting me here, but actually discovering my original book, Hungry <laughs> City, in a secondhand bookshop, you were telling me, somewhere in the UK and thinking this needs to be translated into Spanish. So I have a, a many <laughs> thanks to give to Kois today and also to Neria. Such a pleasure to meet you both and uh, thank you for writing the, the Spanish uh, prologue to the book. Um, I'm, I might stay sitting down because I did a lot of queuing in the airport <laughs> and actually my feet are hurting. So I've got more effort, more energy for my brain maybe if I'm not worrying about my feet, if you don't mind. You can all see me. Fine, I'm hoping. Good. Um, this um, was the moment when I took delivery of my book, uh, Cytopia, which Kois kindly mentioned in his introduction. Um, sorry, I should just also say what a pleasure it is to be at the La Casa Escondida and what a wonderful institution this is and what an inspiring space. So, sorry, um, should have said that. But it is a great pleasure to be here. Um, Yes, uh, Cytopia. So uh, it's a long story why I invented this word. And um, I'm just rolling around so you can actually all see me. I could see someone couldn't. Um, I quite like rolling around. Um, I, uh, I'm an architect um, by training and profession. In fact, it's the only thing I'm actually qualified to do. Um, and for many years, I was designing urban spaces and architecture and so on. And it always struck me that there was something missing. And over the course of probably 20 years, to be honest, I worked out that the thing that was missing was life. <laughs> and I was searching for a way of putting life back into the architectural discourse. Um, and that's how I came up uh, with the idea for my first book, Hungry City. Um, which I think may be on sale at the back, but I'm, I'm not, it is, okay, excellent. So, um, but, and the idea of that book was to, um, to ask the question of what does it take to feed a city, basically. And this is a huge question. I mean, to say how do you feed a city, in a way, is like saying what is urban civilization. I mean, it's absolutely fundamental. 
And to be completely honest with you, I couldn't believe that it was me asking this question because I'm me, you know, I'm just a kind of architect sort of going about my business. So it just seemed like the kind of thing that somebody else would have asked before. I mean, actually, it turned out that uh, I've, I found one other person who had asked the question before, and it was a Victorian historian by the name of George Dodd, who wrote a book in 1856 called The Food of London. And I quote him a lot in my book because, but I only found that book after a few years of working on mine. So why weren't people asking the question? I mean, I kept saying to myself, you know, this is like saying, what is urban civilization? So there must be a whole department in the library that's all about this. But there wasn't. It was just the weirdest, weirdest thing. Um, and anyway, to cut a very long story short, I wrote this book, Hungry City. It took me seven years. Um, and at the end of it, I thought, we live in a world shaped by food. Um, but, but we don't see it because food is everywhere. We're literally made of food. You know, by the time you're 25 years old, there's no atom in your body that you were born with. It's all made up of meals you've eaten. <laughs> you know, so we're made of food. I mean, I'm in Madrid. I'm hoping to go and have some tapas later. You know, I, I, I know it has a very, very high reputation. Our lives revolve around food. Uh, we wouldn't be here without it. Our politics are shaped by it. Our economies are shaped by it. Our climate is shaped by it. Why aren't we talking about it more? And, of course, we are talking about it more now, but I'm just explaining this funny word here, Zootopia, why I invented this word, and I'll explain more about it as I talk. But Zootopia just means food place. Um, and it's from the Greek word setos for food and topos for place. And I invented it because I just thought we needed a way of naming the fact that we live in a world shaped by food. And I, at the time, because as I say, this was at the, during uh, the time I was writing Hungry City, I didn't have any particular agenda for this word. I just thought we need this word. Um, and later I realized, oh wow, we, we not only need this word to describe the fact that we live in a world shaped by food, but this could be a very, very powerful way of not only seeing the world, but, but changing the world for the better. And that's why, I don't know how you go, oh, maybe like this. That's why the, um, the subtitle of my book, my second book, Zootopia, is How Food Can Save the World. That was actually the publisher's idea, to be honest. I would never have had such a Superman-ish sounding subtitle. But they said, well, nobody knows what Zootopia is, so if you insist on calling the book Zootopia, you've got to have a subtitle that makes people buy the book. And I went, oh, okay. But actually, my editor said to me, when I said, I, I can't say how you can save the world, and she said, but Carolyn, you just spent 350 pages saying that. So you do say it, you just don't sort of put it in that kind of language. So that's why the book has this slightly weird title. Um, and now I'm going to explain to you sort of, as it were, how I got here. The question of how to eat is our oldest shared practical question. And it's a fundamental question. I mean, obviously all living creatures share the same problem. All living creatures have to eat. Um, but only humans have sort of elevated the problem to a kind of conceptual, ethical, moral, political problem. Um, and we, this is actually how we evolved. Um, and I love this picture. This is the Hadza uh, in Tanzania. Some of you may know they're some of the last hunter-gatherers on Earth who really live as hunter-gatherers. And they've got kind of teams of anthropologists and sociologists and biologists descending on them the entire time because everyone's desperate to study them before they go Western and start, you know, talking on mobile phones and so on. Um, and it's absolutely fascinating what's being discovered because, for example, they have super microbiomes. You know, they have some of the most healthy, vibrant... I mean, I don't know whether you know, but our, our gut is basically the core of our immune system and it's built up of the stuff we eat, like the rest of us, but critically, it requires complexity in order to become what it really needs to be. And they have microbes in their guts that Western science has never seen before. 
and they think they're linked to, for example, obesity and intelligence and you know, also co cognitive capacity and all the rest of it. So there's huge amounts going on. But what's really interesting to me is that we evolved like this, and actually, biologically, we're still hunter-gatherers, and I think that's something really important to remember. Um, because we've evolved a world that doesn't really suit us, and that's a big part of our problem to begin with. But if you think about this scenario, what's actually going on here, if you're a hunter-gatherer, you wake up in the morning and you think, right, need to eat, let's go hunting, if you're a man. If you're a woman, you generally, almost exclusively, um, you don't go hunting, but you stay around the fire, and the fire, of course, is critical in human evolution because we only discovered how to control fire something like one point... Well, we don't really know when, but somewhere between 800,000 and 1.5 million years ago, it's thought we started to learn how to control fire. And, of course, it was a complete game-changer because fire allowed us to modify the landscape. So our ancestors burnt down bits of forest to improve grazing and to attract animals there which they could hunt easier, for example. But also, critically, it allowed us to start cooking our food. And this was the really massive game changer, because basically, if, if you need to eat every day, which we all do, it's much, much easier if you can cook your food, because it makes a whole range of foods that are indigestible available to you if you cook them. Secondly, you can take calories on board a lot more quickly, because the fire has done half the, the job of digesting for you. And that means that unlike chimpanzees, who have to spend about 16 hours a day chewing, <laughs> you know, they're almost like cows who just have to constantly eat to feed themselves. Our ancestors evolved a way of taking on calories very quickly, which meant they could go hunting every day. And the women were the people who had the backup meal. So if you think about hunting as a way of feeding yourself, it's very high risk because you expend a lot of energy running after an antelope or whatever it is, and it might get away anyway, in which case, no dinner. But if you've got the women back at camp hunting around for tubers and so on and cooking them, and you've got a backup meal, then you know that even if you're not successful at hunting, you can still eat something and then go out the next day again. So I often say, you hunt, I cook, is the oldest social contract in human society. It's a division of labor that allows everybody to eat better. But then what's really interesting is you come back, so half the band's been hunting all day, half the band's been around the fire, keeping the fire going, looking after the kids. If any of this sounds remotely familiar, of course, this pattern of division of labor hasn't changed a lot in to almost millions of years. Um, and the group comes together at the end of the day. And to me, this is the most fascinating bit of all. They share the food. And so you might or might not have an animal. You, you definitely do have tubers that you've cooked. How do you just you know, share it out among the group? And it's fascinating how sophisticated this process of sharing the food is. And basically, people who need the food get the food. So the, the, the strongest hunters who expended the most energy, who are the most valuable to the group because they're the ones that can bring the most food in, they get a nice big slab of whatever they've killed. Um, so I'm talking so much, I was actually going to put my slide thing down. That's very dangerous because um, I've got about 50 slides. Anyway, but, um, but never mind. Uh, the, but, but the critical thing is that we are the only species apart apparently from bonobos who do, who do it a little bit, who share food nicely, who say, oh, no, no, after you, you have more than me. You know, if you watch chimpanzees uh, after a hunt sharing the food, it's... <laughs> it's a fight. <laughs> so this is really fundamental. We learned to be social. We learned to cooperate. We learned to communicate. We invented language. And we invented this sense of fairness around the shared meal. And I often say, because in a hunter-gatherer world, food is unambiguously the most valuable thing that, around. It just is. Uh, and by the way, in our society as well, we've just forgotten it. Um, the, the, the shared meal is therefore the earliest and the most sophisticated and visible and uh, readily accepted economy in human society. 
And I spent a long time talking about that slide because I'm going to come back to all of those ideas later. Sorry, I do talk too much always, but it's a big <laughs> subject. Now, the thing is, the question of how to eat is directly linked, obviously, again, it's obvious when you say it, to the question of how to live. If you're a hunter-gatherer, you don't stay in one place. You follow the food around. And, of course, the, the Garden of Eden, I do realize this is a sort of rather fanciful, it's almost like what Boris Johnson would draw if he was imagining a hunter-gatherer life. You know, it's kind of it's over the top. It's um, essentially very overdone. But, but it, it's no accident, actually, that the idea of paradise um, in the Bible and, indeed, in many other creation uh, myths around the world is associated with a hunter-gatherer life. Why is this? Because... Again, this is, this is a sort of very recent research that's turning all our ideas about hunter-gathering on their head, really. There were a maximum, probably, of 10 million hunter-gatherers in the world before we started farming. That's not many people. That's probably, you know, only about one and a half times the size of Madrid, I'm guessing, or twice or something, you know, in the world. Now, think about it. If you're a hunter-gatherer living in, you know, 200,000 years ago, you're not going to live in the middle of the desert like, you know, well, actually, some of them did, but most people lived in very, very rich areas, river deltas, you know, natural springs, natural forests like this. I mean, the real-life Garden of Eden, as you probably know, is the ancient Near East. It's the so-called Fertile Crescent, um, which is a very, very rich area. Um, Hunter-gatherers, they, they, a lot of them have no concept of work. <laughs> uh, again, so it's no accident in, that in the Bible, you know, when Adam and Eve are expelled from the Garden of Eden, they're made to farm. Farming is seen as a punishment. Farming was always much, much harder work than hunting and gathering. But the one thing that, hunt, uh, that, that farming allowed you to do was to create a big surplus of food. So basically, as a hunter-gatherer, you wander around, you follow the food. There's a sense of abundance. I mean, this is, again, something that modern anthropologists are discovering, that hunter-gatherers see the world as bountiful, whereas farmers see it as, as fraught with scarcity. Because they this kind of... I mean, if you take Adam and Eve to be a mythical version of the Hadza they eat something like 300 different plants and animals every week on average, and hence the complexity, but also a diversity and a flexibility. So if one plant's not there, you eat another one and so on. If you think about what happens when you start to farm, everything shrinks down to, <gasps> is the wheat going to be okay? Because if not, we're going to starve. So you go from a, a sort of a sense of abundance to a sense of scarcity. Um, so, as I say, it, it is now seen as a very idyllic way of life, but obviously one that could never have supported anything like the number of humans that we now have on the planet. Uh, so, if quantity is something you're worried about in terms of the human species, um, it's probably a good thing we started farming. So, uh, but it's up for discussion, actually. It's really seriously up for discussion. That is the real-life Garden of Eden, so the so-called Fertile Crescent, I don't know whether this thing has a pointer on it. Does it have a laser attached to it? Doesn't matter if it doesn't. No, so no. as you can see, it's, it's, it's I mean, so cool because it's fertile, as I was just explaining, and crescent-shaped. Um, what's really interesting about this part of the world is that this is where farming, um, most, most of the animals and plants that we now rely on globally for the majority of our diet, so we're talking cows, sheep, uh, pigs, goats, uh, wheat, um, barley. Uh, I'm running out of I'm running out of plants, um, but you know a, a, a large number of the really key uh, plant and animal species that we domesticated were first domesticated here. <laughs> but there's something really interesting about this, and and the reason they were domesticated we think, is because there was a climate crisis um, around about 12,000 years ago, and the, the world was heating up quite rapidly. The rich forests that people had lived in were drifting northwards. Uh, there was a population explosion, and people needed to find another way of feeding themselves. And so they began to concentrate on planting, saving, protecting you know, uh, certain seeds, uh, including uh, einkorn and emma, which were sort of uh, antecedents of modern wheat, 
and barley, and, and basically gradually shifting from wandering around to staying put, because if you're investing a lot of work in a piece of ground, i.e. farming, you can't just wander off, because if you wander off, somebody else might nick what you've just planted. So it's a complete radical change in the way people lived. What's really interesting, and I don't have time to go into, but you know, in the, the dream three-hour lecture, um, is that people knew how to domesticate plants and animals for about 3,000 years before they began concentrating on it. So there's a huge, huge gap. Why is that? Because actually staying put in one place isn't something people wanted to do, because it limited them. So it was forced on them by the, a new way of eating. If you like, the positive side of all of this is that we got static settlements that gradually over the course of time become complicated enough to be described as cities. And I'm actually going to show you, I mean, if you look at this area here, sorry, I mean, <laughs> can you see, sorry, this is very old fashioned. I needed one of the, a bamboo stick or something. You know. um, Uruk, Ur, Ur and Eridu, that little group of cities down there, they're at the, the, the mouth of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And this is ancient Mesopotamia. And by the way, Mesopotamia just is, it comes from the Greek. It means between rivers. So it's just, it's modern Iraq. Hugely fertile area. Um, and that is why those cities um, grew up there, because people were already living there, because they were already, even before they were farming, they were, I seem to be standing up now. Maybe that's better. Um, my feet seem to have recovered. Um, <laughs> Uh, basically, they, there, were, there were a lot of people there, and they were already in the area. So, so this is why, you know, sort of that part of the, uh, the world was inhabited. And, as I say, they began to concentrate on uh, planting plants, and therefore become static over time. And then, uh, eventually, um, sort of static farming settlements became complex enough to become cities. That's taken me a long time to get here. Um, sorry. But, I mean, it did take us humans a long time to get here as well. But when we start living in cities, everything changes. And I've described briefly already the fact that um, there's a new kind of landscape being created here, which is basically farms, farmland. Um, and it's an artificial landscape. Um, and if we look at one of those cities I just pointed out to you, to the greatest extent that I was able to, we can see that um, what these early cities are like, it, there's a number of things to say about them. One is that they're very small, still. So that's only about 500 meters across. They're very dense. So I don't know whether you can see this residential area here. That would have been typical. The whole city would have been a series of mud huts with tiny little spaces in between. So we're very, very dense. It's surrounded by countryside, of course, and it's on a river, critically, as I just mentioned. Now, I call this the fried egg model of urbanity, because if you think of the yolk of the fried egg as the city and the white of the egg as the countryside, that's basically the arrangement you've got. And it's a very, very good arrangement, because basically your food's being grown next door, you know, what's not to like, zero food miles, et cetera, et cetera. But we'll come on to some of the drawbacks of living in this way. But the critical thing to say is that you have now a duality. So if you think of humans' most essential needs, what those needs are, they fall into two basic groups. One is we need each other. We need society. It's very nice to be with you all here today, you know, physically in the room. We also need nature because we need sustenance. Now, if you think about hunter-gatherers, they solve both of those problems at the same time by just living in groups in nature. I mean, I often call it living in the larder. They're literally living in the landscape that's feeding them. When you start farming, you have a division of landscape into city and country, and you also have a division within society of people who produce food and people who don't produce food. And as it turns out, the people who don't produce the food end up being the powerful ones. So again, it's a flip of the hunter-gatherer scenario. And if you can see that big uh, building complex up there, the temple, famous ziggurat of Ur, if any of you know it, sort of from an architectural point of view. What's really interesting there is that the temple organized the harvest. And if you think about what it takes to organize a harvest, it's not straightforward because you have to work out what grain is going to be harvested when. You have to make sure the labor's available. 
the, the grain was brought into the temple. It was offered up to the gods. It was then stored. If you can see that sort of zigzaggy building, bottom right in the, in the temple, that's the, 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 the city granary. And the granary was like the bank because the grain represented the wealth of the city. Um, and then it was baked in the temple bakeries and it was redistributed during the course of the year. So writing was invented to do this. Accounting was invented to do this. Something approaching a civil service was invented to do this. So again, we see a change in the way people are feeding themselves having a profound effect on the way society is organizing itself. And of course, all sorts of issues stem from that to do with power <coughs> and you know, who gets to do what and all the rest of it. Um, but what's interesting from a sort of, as it were, geographical point of view or a political point of view is that if we were going to try to describe how the world's first cities fed themselves, and of course not all cities were particularly like this, it's just that it's a, a model that was very successful and did, did get repeated in various forms eventually all over the world. We'd say it was a city-state, that's the fried egg, um, so city and country together, and it's dominated by what, we, in modern terminology, we would probably call a large food distribution hub, which happens to have God living in it as well. So a spiritualized version of that. And as I say, it's a very successful model um, that is repeated all over the world uh, with, with variations. Um, now, the first people to address the question of how to feed a city um, in a kind of direct, practical way were the Greeks. Both Plato and Aristotle lived in Athens, as you probably know, and Athens was a city-state or a polis, um, and they both sort of worried about how the city, an ideal city, in fact, would feed itself. And Aristotle, that's Aristotle you're looking at there, he has this wonderful term, political animals, which actually describes the dilemma I was just sort of talking about, which is that we're political, so we need to live in cities to be with other people, but we're animals, which means we need nature, so how do you bring those two things together? And both Plato and Aristotle said the answer was a thing called economia, and economia means household management, from the Greek, oikos, household, and nemein, manage. And here is a sort of um, a diagram explaining how that works. They said the ideal arrangement for a city would be that every citizen would have a house in the city and a farm in the countryside that fed the house. So that is economia. That's good household management. And of course, if every citizen has a house and a farm, bingo, the city can feed itself. And that's ideal because... Both of them thought, if the city can feed itself, then it can be politically independent. It's not dependent on anybody else for its food. The flip side of this is that there's a limit to how big the city can grow, because beyond a certain size, if you think about it, it the geometry doesn't work. You know, you have to go too far to get to your farm. You can't get the food in. And so the Greeks said, OK, obviously the ideal city just has to stay small. And then they argued about how many people should live in it, but they came up roughly with a figure of 30,000 people, so really small. Mm. Um, but, but there you go. And I mean, that actually was the basis of, a, of a, a strain of thought that still continues to today, and I'm going to come on to it, and I'm going to have to speed up because I'm, I've been very slow so far. But I mean, if you think about what we're really talking about here, we're talking about you know, the question of how a city feeds itself being one of a city needing a thing called countryside, which is where all the food for it is grown, and then how do you arrange those two things together? And the ideal, as you can see in this, I mean, my favorite image, by the way, do, do any of you know the Lawrence Setti, uh, this fresco I'm showing you? It's an amazing fresco, as you can see. It's, it's much bigger than this. It's, it's um, yeah, I mean, actually, it's, it's about the size of that wall. You know, because it sits in the t town hall in Siena. So it's really huge, something like 20 metres long. And it shows this ideal relationship between the city of Siena. And, of course, medieval Italian cities were also city-states. So we're back with the fried egg yet again. Um, and it's countryside. And the countryside, as I mentioned earlier, is an artificial landscape. It's been modified to feed the city. So it's fields, it's orchards, it's vineyards, and so on and lots of 
Um, and the question of who these people are diligently working away, of course, is a very big one. Uh, there's all sorts of complexities to discuss about that, but um, they, they, there was a moment in medieval Italy when they sort of became uh, crop sharers, effectively, rather than just peasants who had no power. So there's, there's always a power dynamic at play when you're talking about the city and the countryside. But you can also see a road with asses with grain on their backs coming into the city, a pig being driven to market. You can see hunters leaving to maybe go and shoot a deer. You can, inside the city, see a flock of sheep wandering around. You can see asses arriving, a woman with a basket of eggs on her head, and so on. So even though the image appears to show two kind of separate entities with a wall in between, what you're actually seeing is a dynamic, symbiotic system. And that wall is not a wall, it's a membrane because food and animals and people and money are passing through it all the time. So that's what you're really looking at. And then if you look at the title of this fresco, this fascinates me, it's called The Allegory of the Effects of Good Government. And remember, it's sitting on the town hall in Siena. So all the councillors sitting in Siena, looking up at this, are gonna go, ah, oh, that's what we're supposed to be doing, is maintaining this relationship between the city and the countryside. And actually, for a brief moment, uh, as I say in medieval Italy, some towns did pretty much manage that. So what we're sort of really bouncing through is a series of moments in history when the importance of the relationship between the city and the countryside has been openly acknowledged and even stuck on a wall and painted. It's rare. Of course, if we think about what a modern Lawrence city looks like, it looks more like this. This is just my hometown of London. Uh, and this is the kind of landscape that feeds London. No Londoner ever sees it. There's not just a wall you can walk through. You can't look out the window and look at it. It's the other side of the world. Most people don't even know it exists. It's completely denatured, so would you even bother to paint it? And so on. And I call this the urban paradox. The urban paradox is the fact that the more we gather together in cities to be modern and to be sociable and all the rest of it, the further and further away we're getting from our sources of sustenance. And it's just, it's a paradox because there's no ideal solution to it. But it's part of the urban condition because no city feeds itself. So how did we get here? Well, it's a <laughs> that's another long story. Um, but interestingly, it's only partly uh, a story about technology. So I have briefly mentioned fire, I've briefly mentioned farming, both technologies. And this is all a technological journey, of course, in one way or another. But there was one city that completely blew the trend uh, in the ancient world, and of course that city is Rome. So I call it City 2.0 because it's insane how big Rome got. It had a million citizens by the first century AD, way, way bigger than any other city had ever been. How did it feed itself? Do you have any idea how it fed itself? While I have some water? <laughs> you weren't expecting that, were you? <laughs> Where's the exit? <laughs> Quick. Um, just shout out what comes into your head because you'll be right. Or don't. Coice, how did it feed itself? <laughs> <laughs> Nerea, come on. What, what, what did Rome famously have? And it begins with E. Like, it's like, any ideas at all? Yeah, thank you. Um, well done. Brilliant. Sorry. Well, no, I mean, it's just, it's a, yes, empire. <laughs> it fed itself from an absolutely enormous hinterland. I mean, far bigger than any other city had ever had. There's Rome in the middle. It's, it's chewing up food from the whole of the Mediterranean, the Black Sea, the Atlantic. How is it doing it? It's doing it because it has control of the sea. And if you think about what it takes to feed a city, there's, there's, there's various problems. Problem one, how do you produce the food? Well, you grow grain is the answer to that one. So grain is the food of cities. Problem two, how do you get it into the city? Remember what the Greeks were saying? Oh, well, economia means there's a limit to how big the city can grow because it's just too far. Water changed that because it was 50 times cheaper to transport food by water than over land. And so Rome was able to, I mean, there's a brilliant study that's been done on this that shows that it was cheaper um, to 
get grain in from Carthage on the North African coast than it was to bring it into Rome from 20 miles outside the city. And if you think about it, grain is heavy and bulky. It's very important, but, you know, it's not easy to transport. Million citizens, you know, getting enough grain to feed, you know, baked loaves of bread for a million citizens every day on ox carts, on bumpy roads, not going to happen. The only way Rome could have fed itself was by a huge uh, network of shipping lanes, basically. And, and famously, um, it conquered Sicily, Sardinia, North Africa, and then very, very famously Egypt, if you remember that vaguely from history. Um, Augustus conquers Egypt, um, exports 6,000 farmers to the Nile Delta, builds a huge grain port at Alexandria, and then the grain ships from Egypt become the super tankers of their day, basically. Um, and of course, it's not just grain it's importing, it's also oil, it's pork, it's wine, it's uh, liquamen as a fermented fish sauce, a bit like modern Thai nam pla and so on. But what you see with this map is that Rome is showing that a city, when it gets powerful enough and it can sort the transport out, it can hoover up nutrients from a huge area around it. So you're seeing for the first time the capacity of a city to basically feed itself from a huge food shed, but also in the process destroy that food shed, because of course the nutrients are all being sucked up, they're not being put back. And in fact, over the course of hundreds of years, all of the soils in North Africa began to fail. And in fact, it's a cycle of, of human civilizations in general that they tend to eat themselves to death. And I think in Rome's case, it's probably the most staggering example we have because the empire kept expanding. The main reason to keep expanding it was because they kept needing more and more land for food. And eventually it just got so big it became ungovernable and then the whole thing just basically collapsed. So it, there's many, many fascinating political and ecological parallels between Rome and today. I mean, one I'll just briefly mention is um, the emperors had to feed up to a third of the citizens on a free grain dole because there was no other way of just for people to eat. Um, and so it became highly political. And they used to um, artificially subsidize the cost of shipping to keep the food coming in. So if you think of the parallels to the modern world where we, we don't tax aviation fuel so that we can sort of bring food in from all over the world, amazing, fascinating parallels. And I just, at the bottom, as you probably saw, you know, the idea of food miles, which is this idea of how far is your food travel before you eat it, which you, you may be familiar with, I, I'm imagining. Um, it's not a modern phenomenon, even though obviously now it's gone mad, but it, Rome did it. You know, the average Roman was eating food from all over the place. Now, I've been talking a lot about geography. Um, and the reason is, as I say, that it, when you're talking about the question of how to feed a city, it's a very geographical problem as well as a political and economic one. Um, and the first person who actually sat down and tried to work out how the productive hinterland of a city would naturally evolve was Johann von Schunen, who was a German geographer and landowner. And in 1826, he wrote a book called The Isolated State. And The Isolated State is a fictional place, another of those, and it's uh, just a flat, fertile, featureless plain inhabited by logical, profit-seeking farmers. And von Thunen said, if you stick a city in the middle of this imaginary landscape, how would its productive hinterland naturally evolve? And he said, well, obviously, in the outskirts, you'd have market gardening, so you'd grow fruit and vegetables. Why? Fruit and vegetables are very difficult to transport very far, so basically, you're not going to be bringing them in from, you know like Rome was, Egypt or whatever. And secondly, they're luxury foods. They were luxury foods then as now, actually. Um, and so basically, the farmers could afford the high land rents close to the city. And last but not least, they could make very good use of night soil, which is human and animal manure, which was saved and, and put on the land to bring the fruit on ahead of season. And people would pay crazy money for basically food that tasted of horse shit, um, but was two weeks earlier than it might otherwise be. So things don't really change. Um, so there's that ring of market gardening. Then there's a band of about 20 to 30 miles of, of various things, including grain production. 
Grain's the most important food because, as I've mentioned a few times, it's the staple food of the city. But as I've also mentioned, it's very heavy and bulky and difficult to transport. So actually, beyond about sort of, let's call it 30, 35, 40 kilometers, it's uneconomic for a farmer to bring it in to the city. So this limits the size to which the city can grow. And then beyond that, you have livestock grazing because the animals can walk into market. And indeed, many animals did. I mean, I know Madrid, I mean, Madrid's a very, I haven't done a whole Madrid thing or, you know, but, but it is interesting that it's not on a navigable river and that created enormous problems historically for it and the whole hinterland was kind of screwed up with sheep production as I understand it. But anyway, and I think there is still sheep walking through the city on a special mm -hmm. day, aren't there? Anyway, so animals could walk into the city and they could come from a long way away. Um, and actually, it was very economic to do this because the land itself was unimproved, as Adam Smith called it. So in other words, you just had a patch of grass, you could stick a cow or a sheep on it, and they just got on with it. They, they grew, they became food uh, without you having to do very much about it. Um, now, the only uh, sort of concession to geography that Yvonne Tunin made was to say that if the city was on a navigable river, then all of those bands could be a lot further away because you could take the grain to the river and then bring it in much more easily. So remember this thing of uh, it being uh, up to 50 times, uh, it's been reckoned 50 times cheaper and easier to transport food by sea in the, in the pre-industrial world and probably something like 15 times cheaper by river. So it made a big, big difference and meant the city could grow bigger. Now, it's all a bit abstract when you're just looking at diagrams. It's much more interesting if you look at real cities. This is my home city of London. And I've just analyzed the maps um, in terms of sort of working out where the food was coming in. And I've done the vegetables. Well, I didn't actually do anything to that one, but you can just see, as von Thunen said, the city is surrounded by market gardens, and all cities were, all pre-industrial cities were. Um, Grain is the yellow map, and it's coming in by river because the grain is heavy and bulky, so that's, most of the grain was coming in that way. Um, it's trying to get up to Cornhill, and of course the name tells you that's where it was being traded. Bread Street tells you again it's traveling up there, trying to get to the center of the city. Um, fish is obviously also coming in by river. Queen Hyde and Billingsgate were the two main river ports. You can see maybe just about Fish Street. That's obviously where you buy your fish. And Friday Street, interestingly, is where you bought your fish on a Friday when the eating of meat was forbidden. And of course, meat was a seasonal food in the pre-industrial world um, and, a, and a very prized and precious food. And most people couldn't afford fresh meat. Um, but the, the church actually limited the amount of meat eating that was allowed as a way of just keeping demand for meat down. Um, and, and here we have meat, um, the last map, um, in red, Smithfield, you can see that big blob there. That's because most of uh, the, the animals, the cows and sheep feeding London were coming from as far afield as Scotland and Wales and Yorkshire, areas where there's very good grass. They're walking in, uh, conglomerating into Smoothfield outside the city, and that's why Smithfield got its name, and Smithfield is still London's main meat market today, amazingly, hundreds of years later. Um, and in fact, that's another key thing to say about food ways in general is that once they're established, they're very difficult to move for the obvious reason that the food just has to keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. So it tends, markets once established often stay in the same place for hundreds of years. Mm. And often they predate the city because many cities evolved at natural meeting places as did London. In fact, uh, London, uh, Borough Market here, which is, you might have heard of a famous market, was established on the south of the river uh, as a natural fording place, and that's basically why London is where it is. Now, I mean, you know, I would love to do a whole lecture about markets because they're some of my favorite places, and they're so important in terms of what the city is. And also, of course, critically, they are the space where the country comes to the city. So if you look at this image of Smithfield, I just pointed it out on the map. This is when it's still a livestock market. So this is in the early 19th century. There were up to 10,000 animals in this space at any one time. So you can imagine the confusion. That's why I call this slide necessary chaos. Um, but also you can imagine that if you lived in a city like that, 
you couldn't not know where your food came from because it's basically mooing and bleating outside your window. And of course, the chaos involved killing the animals, and that was unregulated. Um, so you had 184 unregulated unreg slaughterhouses around the market. There's an amazing description of it in, uh, in Oliver Twist, Charles Dickens's wonderful book of London. And he just talks about the mess and the mud and the chaos and the blood and the carcasses hanging. And you know, you'd really get a, a visceral sense of how present in people's lives the fact of life and death would have been. But of course, markets were also, uh, they were also the places where people went to socialize and be convivial, because that's where the food was. So this map here on the left, which I absolutely love, is right round the corner from Smithfield. I mean, you can tell pie corner. I mean, imagine the Y is an I, people are eating pies. But those red blob blobs are huge public ovens, because most people living in cities didn't have kitchens, and they couldn't cook for themselves. So if you wanted cooked food, you had to go out. And these are all taverns. And basically, you can either go and have takeaway. All cities had takeaway from the beginning. Or if not that, you can actually buy a joint in the market and go and have it cooked for you. And you can hire a room, and you can entertain your friends. So people did a huge amount of eating out. And I think just as an English person being in, in Spain, it's really interesting that you still, I think, have much more of a tradition of going out to eat as a, as a thing. You know, we tend to kind of stay at home and order up our ready meals, but you still have this tradition. But we used to have it. We've lost it, but that's another long story. Um, and, of course, coffee houses also evolved around markets, and they became the places where people would go and just sit down with strangers and share knowledge and so on, and many newspapers came out of them and so on. Um, and I just love this image at the top. That's from 1571, and that's London Bridge. So that's literally by Borough Market, I was just pointing out. And you can see it's a takeaway, but they're also catering a wedding that day. So there's a wedding feast laid on, but there's also a place where you can just walk up and buy a pie. So it's just this sense that the pre-industrial city was flowing with food, basically. Now, I say all of that because, and I, I mean, it's an incredibly brief summary of a hugely complex sort of issue or culture, because this is the pivotal moment when everything changes. And I mean, you'll, you'll note 1831, this is one year after the image I just showed you. And you will note, so this is the first ever commercial railway built anywhere in the world. It was actually built to take uh, coal from the, the docks of Liverpool to Manchester, where the Industrial Revolution was happening. But you can see cows are hitching a ride already, you know, so that everything I've been talking about gets disrupted. And that's why I call this slide Goodbye Geography, because basically three key things change at this point. I am going to go on too long. I just don't, there isn't anything I can really do about that. I mean, well, should I just keep speeding up to infinity, or should I just keep talking until you <laughs> tackle me to the ground? <laughs> Sorry, I, I was very slow to begin with. I, it's because I was tired and I was sitting down. Sorry. Anyway, um, three key things change. I didn't get an answer out of that, so I'll just carry on talking. Three key things change at that point. The first thing is, obviously, it's the first time it's been possible to transport food big distances rapidly. So this changes everything. So that, that whole sort of constraining of geography that I've been talking about goes away. This means cities can be built pretty much any size, any shape, and anywhere. That's thing one. Thing two... The food which has been visible because, you know, you know, lunch has been walking up the street outside your window. Now what's going to happen is the animals are going to be killed in the countryside. They're going to come in as dead meat in the middle of the night. So you don't see food anymore. Don't see the reality of it. And the third thing, and I haven't talked very much about this today, but it's really critical, is that up until this point... The kind of control that the temples took over feeding people in ancient Ur all the way back then continued in some form or other. So city administrations, their biggest headache was how to feed the city. And it, was, it, was, it took a huge amount of their effort and so on. Certain cities had a bigger problem than others. Uh, again, it's a long story. I didn't even put the slides in to have this conversation because I knew I wouldn't have time. But basically, um, London had a much more laissez-faire attitude than Paris because the Thames is navigable and the Seine is not. And there's a reason why the French had a revolution and we didn't. So that is all I'm saying. But anyway, it's a long, complex conversation. 
But basically, this is the moment that political leaders globally kind of go, thank goodness I don't have to worry about food anymore, and they hand all the power over to the food industry. So that's just a graphic showing you what I was just describing. That's London in 1840 when the first railway showed up. It's barely grown since the medieval city. Plans I just showed you very, very rapidly, 60 years later and then 30 years after that, total splurge. You couldn't possibly feed a city like that from just one or two little markets that you know were highly regulated and all the rest of it. So you have a deregulation of the food system and urban sprawl. And of course, somewhere on the other side of the world, you have agri-sprawl, because the railways also, I mean, critically what the railways do is they open up parts of the new world that have otherwise been inaccessible. So we have, for example, the American Great West, top left, tens of millions of bison, several Native American tribes living with them. Uh, they get massacred, basically. I mean, they literally just machine gunned them from the backs of trains. I mean, you know, it's brutal. They had no interest in the bison or indeed the Native Americans. You could just say they piled up the skulls. What they wanted was this. They wanted the land to grow grain on, and it's the first time in history that the world's had a massive grain glut, more grain than anyone knew what to do with. And then they came up with a brilliant idea of what to do with it, which was to feed it to cows. And you all know how this story goes, because basically this is how most of the meat we now eat is produced. Now, the, the stupidity of this is if you think about the reason why we co-evolved with cows and sheep, it's because they could eat grass, as I was just explaining. Um, we can't eat grass, but we can eat cows and sheep, and we can drink their milk. Once you start feeding them on food that you could be eating, it, it makes no sense anymore. Plus, the animals get sick. So feeding a cow grain is like feeding your kids fast food. They basically, they'll eat it, they like it, but it makes them sick and it doesn't nourish them properly. And it, in fact, the value of their meat changes. It stops being high in omega-3s and becomes high in omega-6s, and all sorts of stuff goes on. It's, 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 it's bonkers, but it's fundamental to the evolution of the modern food system. And again, the whole story of Chicago and its responsibility for evolving the modern food system is fascinating, and I, I, I mean, it's all in the book. <laughs> I don't have time to go into it, but I mean, it's when that idea of cheap food starts. So if you remember at the beginning, I was saying, you know, the Hadza, the thing about the Hadza and other hunter-gatherers is that food is the most important thing in their lives. And by the way, it's still the most important thing in our lives. It's just we've created a whole world that pretends it isn't. So we have this thing called cheap food, which doesn't actually exist. We've created it by externalizing the true cost of its production. And, and, I, I, and here's one of them, for example. So this happened in the, in the Midwest. So you can't just go from having perennial, sorry. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> sorry, that first 15 minutes was awful. I just knew I was, just gonna, I knew that was gonna be a disaster. I will, I will go as fast as I can. Um, <clears throat> you can't just go from perennial, uh, grassland to annual cropland without doing huge damage to the soil. And it worked for decades because the soil was unbelievably rich, but it was not being, nothing was being put back, and over time it just got weaker and weaker. And then there was a sort of famous series of dry uh, years, drought, and the, all the topsoil of the Midwest just blew away in the famous Dust Bowl. Mm. This is the beginning of a debate we're still having today between you know, loosely chemicals or no chemicals. So, so the two schools, and, and some of you probably know, you know, a huge amount about this, so forgive me if that's the case. The chemical road or the industrial road, I've got Justus Liebig here. He was the German chemist who first worked out that what plants mostly need is nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, MPK. And uh, Haber and Bosch were two more German chemists who worked out how to artificially fix nitrogen. Nitrogen is the key um, nutrient for plants. Most of it's in the atmosphere. Uh, too much detail, but basically, um, uh, certain plants, leguminous plants, can fix it in the soil. That's one way of getting it available to plants. And the other is a lightning strike. And what the Harbour Bosch process does is it mimics a lightning strike using a huge amount of energy. But that is how modern nitrogenous fertilizers are produced. And if I tell you that 
between two, 40 and 50% of the global population wouldn't have enough to eat if it wasn't for this process. That gives you some idea of how profound the industrial food revolution has been. But it's a problem because this is a disaster. <laughs> Um, and the reason it's a disaster is because this is how nature works. So nature um, creates natural bonds, and that's Albert Howard. He was the first um, plant scientist to really work out how this happens. Plants, as you probably remember from your kind of, I don't know, biology days, they, they do a thing called photosynthesis, which allows them to create... So you're smiling as if it's just yesterday you were talking about this. But anyway... Um, uh, I, it's one of those things that you kind of, you know, when you're eight and someone's banging on about photosynthesis and you kind of go, yeah, whatever, you know, and then 40 years later you think, oh, good grief, if they couldn't do that, none of us would be here. It's literally the basis of the land-based food system and indeed the sea-based food systems, the whole food system. Anyway, they make sugars from sunlight and water, um, essentially, and then they feed it to fungi in the soil and fungi are the ones that can extract the micronutrients from minerals in the soil. And what you have under there is a sort of um, a marketplace between plant fungi and plants. And it's critical. It's critical to plant health. It's the basis of plant health. It goes back to what I was saying at the beginning about complexity being the basis of health. Now, if you feed plants NPK, it's precisely like feeding your kids you know, hamburgers and chips every day of their lives. They'll be fine, they'll be happy. No, they won't be at all fine, but they'll be happy, they'll do it. But they won't evolve complexity in their bodies and they, they will have no powerful Im immune system. Exactly the same happens with plants. If you feed them MPK, they don't bother to form these connections. So none of the micronutrients are getting into the plants. And guess what? If the plants are the base of the food system, we're not getting them either. So that's, that's one of the problems. And I only have... A vanishing 15 minutes, so I won't go on. But anyway, it's a sort of it's a, a debate that it, it's possibly one of the most critical debates we're having as a species, and it's raging, as I don't have to tell you. Um, and we'll come on to it again at the end. Now, actually, the organic lobby were winning that argument, and then this happened. And wars, of course, we now have a war in Ukraine. Wars disrupt everything because when there's a war on, people panic. And they say, we've got to get the food, doesn't matter how we do it. And basically what happens is, or happened in the Second World War, is governments literally went right down the chemical road and they, they grubbed up all the hedgerows and they said, we just have to produce food. And, and, and they basically the chemicals, there's a weird crossover between the sort of munitions factories and everything that were working at the time. So anyway, long story. Uh, but that's the moment really when we sort of made a fateful fork in the road and went down that sort of chemical route. Of course, post-war was all about cars. So we're now hopping back into that story of the evolution of cities. So we've seen what the railways did. Now cars take what railways did and sort of multiply it by 100. So you start getting landscapes like this, which is basically all about the car. Nobody in their right mind walks in America. I mean, I basically, I've been arrested in America for walking. You know, I mean, in Miami, because there were no pavements, so I was kind of walking along the side of you know, people's gardens and cars going, ee, ee, and then eventually a policeman came and said, ma'am, you appear to be lost, or, you know, and I said, oh, I'm just trying to get to the Serpentarium. Anyway, it's a long story. But, you know, so you don't walk in that kind of landscape, and, of course, those are cities. Back to our fried egg. This is the yolk spilling out all over the white stuff because that's all over prime farmland. Why is it over prime farmland? Because the original city around which this kind of thing splurged would have been founded deliberately in a fertile place because that's where you found cities, is where you can feed them. Um, so instead of walking to a market, you drive out of town to a box that's, that's air-conditioned. You walk around in the so-called eternal springtime. This is actually the first mall ever built. It was built by an Austrian architect called Victor Gruen, uh, who'd, who'd actually escaped from Hungary just before the war, um, and he built this mall. And, of course, we all now know this model. It's gone global. And, of course, food is also being denatured at this point. So if you remember all of that, oh, fresh fruit and veg in the city fringes, now it's all been kind of, you know, bombarded with gases and dehydrated and whatever and stuck in a box. And it's doing crazy logistical stuff, you know. And she just popped out for a pint of milk, and she's kind of come back, and she's just got all these packets 
And, you know, and, and she's going to stick half of it in the fridge and it'll go off and so on. So it's the beginning of our profound disconnection with food. And as I said before, there's no such thing as cheap food. And if you remind yourself that food actually consists of living things that we either hunt or nurture and then kill so we can eat or stay alive, therefore, you know, food is life, basically. So if you, um, if you expect food to be cheap, you're really saying you expect life to be cheap. Um, so we have these external analyses. We have degraded farmland. We have climate change. We have uh, huge amounts of fresh water being squandered in, from non-renewable resources. We have obesity, diet-related disease. I mean, even pandemics like COVID, of course, are the result of the concentrations. In, I mean, you know, the next one's probably going to be bird flu. It already is. Um, concent animal concentrations and the reduction in complexity. Vast amounts of waste feeding the grain harvest uh, to animals when we could be eating it first, spending vast amounts of energy, and, of course, the resulting decline in bird and animal life. Um, and very unfortunately, this uh, model is going global um, because there's a huge amount of vested power in it. So this is where the politicians, having basically handed over responsibility for feeding people to the food industry, comes in. <laughs> this is about halfway through my lectures. <laughs> Oh um, we need a rethink. And I love this quote. This is from a British architect called Cedric Price. Um, and he basically said, technology is the answer, but what was the question? And I, I can't think of a better question. So the whole story I've been talking about is how we've acquired new technologies that have allowed us to live differently, feed differently, and so on, but at a cost. And we've forgotten the basic question. What is the basic question? It hasn't changed. It's what's a good life. How do we live well? How do we eat? How do we share food? How do we, if we're going to live in cities, how do we keep the city and the country together? And, as, and, and I've talked about quite a lot of this already. I've mentioned the Greeks, the fact that they're obsessed with this thing called economia. By the way, I should have said, if that word sounds familiar, of course, it's, it's the root of our modern word economy, which is interesting, because it's the opposite of what the Greek sense was. Um, Thomas More's utopia was basically a series of city-states linked together. There was a critique of London, which he thought was getting too big and too greedy. How many of you know the Garden City model out of interest? I should have asked you at the beginning who you all were. I don't know who I'm talking to. Do any of you know the Garden City model? Is it familiar at all? No. Um, mm. It's literally saying, let's go back to the fried egg. So it's Thomas More with railways, basically. So it's saying, let's limit the size of the city to about 30,000, build new urban hubs in the countryside, surround them by dedicated farmland, link them up by railway. And so what Howard is trying to do is he's trying to solve what I have called the urban paradox. He's trying to say, how can we have society and nature both very readily available? And the way we do it is by keeping the city small, but linking up lots of cities together. It's a very powerful model. I mean, I'm particularly very fascinated by this model. Now, now we're coming back to Zootopia. This is why I invented this weird Greek word, really, because utopia can't exist and doesn't exist because it aims at an ideal. So it's a double derivation word from the Greek word for good or the Greek word for no. And I remember when I read that many, many years ago now, finding it really depressing because I thought, well, we desperately need a multi-dimensional way of asking all the right questions and asking what is a good life, if the result can't exist, we're, we're screwed. And that is why I invented Cytopia. Cytopia is a food-based alternative to Utopia because food shapes our lives in multiple ways, as I've already said. It connects everything together, and it is the most valuable thing in our lives. If we treated it as such, everything would change. That's the idea behind Cytopia. Basically, it says food is like a flow going through our lives the whole time, from the countryside to markets to shops to cafes, through our bodies, out into the world again. And at each stage of that journey, we have choices. So, for example, if we're going to eat meat, do we have the cows eating grass, which is basically why we co-evolve with cows, or do we feed them full of grain and have them wandering around in their own poo being pumped full of antibiotics and getting sick? That's a concentrated animal feeding operation. Do we leave the city in the name of efficiency to get our food, or do we actually animate public space with food? 
Do we take time for food? So, I mean, one of my favorite stats pre-pandemic is that one in five meals in America was being eaten in a car. I just love sitting that, you know, leaving that sitting in the... One in five meals in America is eaten in a car. It just makes you question, what are we doing? You know, how can we have evolved a society where we're too busy to eat? Anyway... So do we take time for food? The question is, which of these choices actually results in a good life? Which make us happy? There are competing paradigms here. One is that food is just a problem to be solved. That's a woman drinking a thing called Soylent. I don't know whether you've heard of it. Have you heard of it? Soylent? It's a kind of food replacement sludge that an American sort of um, wireless uh, mask designer came up with. It's very big in the States. It's very big among tech communities. The idea is you invent something that replaces food so you don't have to think about food, so you're free to just wander around looking beautiful. Or do we need to go back the other way and rediscover food as the basis of pleasure and the things we do together and craft and so on? Um, and that is the inventor of Soylent. He's called Rob Reinhardt. Reinhardt, sorry. And this is maybe one of the most telling quotes of any quote I've read from anyone about food. Worrying about something as simple as food in the digital age is weird. So that just gives you the tech mindset in, an, in a nutshell. You know, we can just tech our way out of it and then we can just be free. The opposite of that, in a way, is obviously where I sit, you will have guessed already, Epicurus. He basically, his argument is... We are built for pleasure. We're built to sort of enjoy eating. Our bodies reward us for doing it and for doing other things we need to do as well, like exercising and pooing and all the rest of it. Why wouldn't you build a good life around those things? So instead of running away from necessity, you embrace it and you enjoy it. Um, these are competing paradigms. You, you can sort of feel traces of them when, whenever people are talking about food. It's like, oh, right, they're in that camp or in there they're pushing that idea. You will find a lot of people now arguing that this is the future. This is, uh, if you've heard of it, so, so, uh, so lean. Um, basically, protein made from sunlight using various bacteria. Lots of people getting very excited about it. But the question about this is, who's going to own it? You know, does it actually give us a good life? Is it enough to just say, oh, how can we produce a thing that will nourish humans? Or are there all sorts of other questions we have to be asking about how do we want to live? Two billion people globally still feed themselves directly. And there's a form of sovereignty about that. And actually, quite a lot of them don't want to stop doing it. So there, and there's so many questions surrounding all of this, which hopefully you can get into in a minute if I stop talking. Um, that's just a graphic way of, as it were, demonstrating the difference between the mindsets. You know, that's what British cheese looked like in 1970. I can tell you, I can vouch for it because I was there. This is what it looked like just before the pandemic. So a different attitude to whether to bother with cheese or not just gives you, you know, that's 600 different farmers around the country, farming with animals, doing it regeneratively, making something amazing, just bringing richness to life. Food is never just food. There are no silver bullets, and the fact that we've evolved different ways of living in landscapes historically tells you that. And we're very, very adaptable animals. So the Maasai, for example, live off the blood and milk of their cows. Um, you know, and Inuit barely eat vegetables either. Their, their livers evolved to allow them to create carbohydrates out of protein. Obviously, if I'm going to use a word like terroir, I have to show a French vineyard. You know, sort of the idea that a good life is about establishing a relationship in a particular place and developing skills and knowledge that allow you to live well in that place. And if you lose that, you're losing literally tens of thousands of years of wisdom about how to live sustainably, because this is sustainable by definition. Otherwise, it would have disappeared. Um, it's obviously about value. I've said several times that there is no such thing as cheap food. It's ironic that it's usually during a crisis we remember the value of food. So during the Second World War, uh, during the, after the collapse of the Soviet Union in Cuba, when the cars left Detroit, people immediately went back to growing food. And of course, it was for the wrong reasons. But then out of that came new social networks, new movements, all of which still exist today and are very, very powerful. Um, this is about democratization. Basically, I mean, you know, if 
you realise, as I do, that, you know, if that's a food system and that's society, they map onto each other like this, then if you want to live in, in, in a democracy, you can't have a food system that looks like that because it's a monopoly, and that's what we've got at the moment. So what, one of the things that the food movement does is it joins the roots to the branches. So it joins farmers directly to consumers. It doesn't get rid of the sort of the middlemen, they're still there, but they don't have a monopoly anymore. And, you know, one way of visualizing that is the idea of co-producing. I don't know whether any of you know Carlo Petrini, the founder of the Slow Movement, but it's a wonderful term he has, co-producing. So instead of farmers and consumers, which is obviously sort of, you know, what the majority of urban civilizations are split into, the consumers become co-producers. So you go out and meet the farmer and you maybe, for example, top left, community-supported agriculture, you pay the farmer ahead of time to feed feed you for the year, and maybe you go and work on the farm, um, or you, join, you people get together and they work in a thing that looks like a supermarket but is actually a cooperative that does direct deals with farmers within a certain radius of the city. That's a 50-year-old one in New York, which has done amazingly well. I don't have to tell you what vegetable box schemes are. They're just obviously a direct connection between farmer and consumer. And I just put this in as well because, you know, the city can also have institutions that permit smaller scale food businesses to thrive within them. Um, as an architect who thinks through food, obviously where it all starts to come together for me is the idea that we embed food in our conception of a city and, and how we inhabit landscape. Uh, and there is now a thing called food planning. And it's about, for example, preserving peri-urban land around cities so they can carry on farming, embedding food in city policy, recreating the kind of food hubs that we used to have before the supermarkets took over, critically protecting infrastructure. I mean, very few people understand how important abattoirs are, but if you're going to have farm regeneratively using animals, which I believe we should, you need these people. You, know, you need family smaller scale businesses that fit that model. Um, I'm very nearly done, by the way. Um, that's Barcelona. You know, obviously, I mean, it's interesting. As a, an English person, you go to Barcelona, and I'm sure to Madrid as well. It's just I happen to be more in Barcelona. You know, oh, you know, these wonderful markets and all the rest of it. And you just, I mean, it is partly to do with the fact that your traditional food culture is still much, much more intact than ours is. But it's also about the fact that the city recognizes the importance of having markets, and they invest millions and millions and millions of pounds into them, which we do not do in the UK. We expect them to compete with supermarkets, and they can't. So, you know, in the end, you need planning, you need, you need politics, you need economics. In order to do this, we have to change everything. Patchwork farms is just the, and, and actually Coys took me <laughs> to one on the way here, is just the idea that anywhere in the city can become a productive space. And it doesn't have to look like a farm. It can be on a roof. It can be on a wall. It can be in a tiny pocket of space. But it's all, it all matters, and it all adds to a sort of a, a re-embracing of the value of food, which is what I'm arguing for, and then rethinking our idea of a good life around it. I'm sure a lot of you have heard there's a huge resurgence of ideas in how we can farm regeneratively. I personally think that battle between organic versus chemical is over. I think we have to stop farming with chemicals, and we can do it. And again, maybe we can come to that in the Q&A. Um, but, you know, there are all these extraordinary models that are about mimicking nature, stopping, you know, stopping plowing so the soil can form those connections I was talking about earlier and so on. And I've said here, Economia 2.0, because again, at a sort of regional level, I think this is what we need to do. Now, this is not a new idea. I talked quite a lot earlier on about the Greeks. But it is about how we can develop cities so that they still maintain a strong relationship with their local countryside or hinterland. Patrick Geddes, known as the father of, of regional geography, suggested simply protecting rural areas in a kind of star shape. So you get a star shaped city and therefore a very big urban rural perimeter. Um, there's an English architects called Berlin Vilja, <clears throat> don't sound English, but well, they're based in England anyway who are proposing replanting, joining up available spaces like car parks and stuff with productive farms and joining them up together to, in a way, do it backwards. Uh, just the idea that, you know, for example, any city has latent productivity in its hinterland, much of which is not being utilized because 
The economics of modern food systems don't allow them to be. So just seeing what's there and saying how can we connect them is a big thing. And of course, you know, and this is in the Netherlands, the idea that we can build new cities and incorporate food growing into them. There's many, many ways that we can bring about a new economy, bring the city and the country closer together. Ultimately, what we're doing in this way is creating landscapes for human and non-human flourishing. And that's kind of where I've got to in my thinking. I think that's what we need to be imagining doing. And again, there's many, many inspiring models for how we do this. And I've just picked a few from Antwerp, from New York. This is one I'm actually involved in in London called Zootopia Farm, very excitingly. And this is my last slide, and I can talk for about 40 minutes on it, but I'm not going to. But um, <laughs> in a way, it just summarizes everything I've been trying to say to you. Basically, you know, when you have a bowl of soup in front of you, the whole universe is in that bowl of soup. And that sounds like a bit of poetry, but it's not. It actually is true. Because from the scale of how we eat, who we share with, who cooks for us, where the food originally came from, the market, how that's connected to the household, where it sits in the city, how that connects to the countryside, how that all sits within a thing we call nature, and the fact we're on a sort of big spinning, rotating planet, sort of hurtling through space, which of course gives us day and night and gives us seasonality and all the rest of it, it's all profoundly connected. And that is why food has such power, because it's both simple, because you all eat, and we all know what a spoonful of soup is, but within that bowl of soup is the power to transform the world. And that's why when my editor said, can we call the book How Food Can Save the World, she won me over, because it is actually what I believe. So thank you very much for listening. I'm sorry I took so long. And um, if you want to know any more, it's in these books, which now look like that over there. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs> Vas a decir pues nada, no, Nerea, cuéntanos tus reflexiones al calor de haber leído los libros de Nerea, Caroline, al haber escuchado ahora. Nerea, ¿puedes compartir tus reflexiones después de haber leído Caroline's books? Estoy pensando, estoy pensando en el paralelo universo, ok. Sí. Pues nada. Eh, oh, I'm so loud. Well, I was sitting here listening to you and I was thinking, wow, it's a bit strange. It's like hearing you story tell the books in a way. And uh, you actually went through the whole history of humanity. It was super interesting. Uh, we would have been sitting there for longer listening to you. And of course, uh, in the present and, and beyond. So it's been lovely. And I'm sure that uh, the rest of the room feels the same. And, and in a way, picking up on your on your reflections and uh, also talking about the, the contents of these sessions that we have organized around ecotopias, generating narratives, and uh, exciting imaginaries uh, to consider how we can transition towards um, more democratic scenarios, more collaborative and sustainable scenarios. Well, against that backdrop, I do have some questions and I'd like to put them forth. In recent times, and actually COIS has been behind many of these processes, but in recent times we've had meetings, workshops here at La Casa Encendida to, to also on the occasion of other meetings about social economy, for instance, or food policies too. And there we have tried to share those outlooks on the future. And uh, there's available materials that everyone can go back to. So I was going over them, and uh, I put my finger on some concepts and ideas uh, that arise very frequently. Some of them had to do with actually putting eco-dependence at the center, interdependence, mutual care too that uh, getting together, caring for one another, and also caring for the planet uh, uh, for where we live, and how that also entails slowing down a little bit, uh, devoting more time to some things, the time that we devote to ourselves, too. There was another idea that had to do with the bioregions, with had to
to do with uh, the foot sets uh, that you mentioned earlier, having proximity cycles to reorganize cycles to reorganize the foot system with new institutions too so that we can make current the commons, uh, which is something that you touch on, on in your book, democratizing the food system too, and connecting uh, with uh, community infrastructures uh, to reconnect and to satisfy our needs uh, from a different perspective. But in addition, uh, there is a rural-based perspective in a way, going back to lifestyles which are simpler, mm, smaller populations, and here, well, uh, this took us to the hunter-gatherer concept too, and and I don't think that was uh, that was raised in previous uh, in previous talks. But perhaps this means sidelining the city in a way a little bit, and it's also because it's very complex uh, to reorganize this artifact that is so complex, right? The city. And that was uh, maybe one of the, the questions that I wanted to raise. How can we balance, balance out the relationship be between farmlands and the city, the role to be, to be played by, by the cities, and what the future could look like at the cities? That was like the first issue. Let me go on, talk about another aspect, and then we can recap. Another question that, uh, that arises here is alternatives uh, from the right to, to food we can see clear alternatives. Uh, from the standpoint of the right to food, we can see clear alternatives. And for instance, uh, metabolism, ecologic farming um, is there. We need to wonder whether we can feed from uh, those from systems that don't depend on chemical uh, consumption ag uh, and agroecology, something that has been working for quite a long time, uh, experimented with short cycles, ecologic uh, farming systems, Systems, uh, uh, economic relationships uh, that are alternative, uh, an alternative to uh, the capitalist, uh, the capitalist way of doing things. Also, food hubs, as you mentioned, cooperative um, supermarkets, uh, which also uh, exist in in Madrid, like the one of Park Slope, and. Uh, all these initiatives that we have in the present confront uh, an economic system and a momentum in the way in which we consume that make them difficult to thrive. And here comes my second question, because if we lack the support of public policies, it's very difficult for these alternatives to actually gain the weight that uh, they should have. So this is another question that I wanted to put on the table right uh, that tension the role to be played by public spheres uh, to allow for some space for a community for the community to thrive to and in order to have a collective management that actually better matches the real needs and also thinking about policies, I thought about uh, several aspects, uh, some clear aspects. We have a network of protected lands, uh, Natura 2000, at uh, the European level. Why don't we have a network of productive uh, lands that are, can be protected and regulated? Or maybe I was thinking about uh, some aspects that you considered in your book. There is no strong political planning over what's uh, produced and consumed uh, in world wars that there was indeed. And uh, right now, we don't even th consider the idea of having uh, rationing policies uh, because if there's a greater scarcity of food or water, we may need this. So those were some ideas that I came up with. Uh, we need to consider whether this is a crisis, a moment of crisis, a critical moment uh, when things need to change. And we need to consider what, where we are headed to, right? And also public awareness is important. And the role of, uh, of public uh, bodies is to be considered 
right? Because uh, for victory movement or uh, um, mobility, uh, using bicycles uh, during world wars. I mean, those were times when, in a way, it was self-evident. It was there was a crisis, and right now maybe it's not self-evident, or not for everyone because not everyone has to suffer that ecological crisis in the same way in their day-to-day -day life. They just maybe see it in very specific moments. They see glimpses of it. They see how fragile the food system is. And also, in addition, we need to consider that institutional campaigns no longer have the strength they had in the past, because right now there's a lot of media outlets, uh, many channels uh, through which we communicate. There's a lot of misinformation, too, and there's campaigns that are orchestrated to put forth a parallel world in which none of the real problems are such ecological or ecological so or social problems. So how can we create that uh, collective momentum to trigger that cultural change? What is it that's needed? Institutional campaigns, uh, sessions like the ones organized in La Casa Santandia, IKEA adds uh, to generate excitement about a new way of life. Uh, for instance, campaigns like the ones uh, that uh, Greenpeace uh, did this morning in Madrid about climate change. Maybe we need it all, right? We need books, we need podcasts, Netflix series. And from the cultural perspective, we also need to consider what could be the trigger, right? Or the driver of all this. And also, going back to what you mentioned at the end of your presentation, this also needs to trigger that we start thinking about alternatives that don't just stay at the individual level, but that also go to the community level. And we need to consider whether what we eat is sustainable or close to us, but we also need to consider with whom we're eating and in what way we're eating it. And uh, Koi talks uh, about uh, a concept uh, Com commensality, as he called it, uh, he, and uh, indeed, uh, it's about eating so sociably. And well, he has a lot to say about this. So there is uh, that concept of community, and there's another concept that has to do with a cultural change: uh, the food culture, the the territory culture too, which is about thinking that we need rural areas, but we need to generate and adapt that knowledge again. It's knowledge that has been created over a lot of time, and in architecture, perhaps it's easier because it it's it remains, right? And materials remain, how that was oriented, how buildings were oriented, how they worked. But for instance, farming culture, in many occasions, well, we have the landscapes that still remain, but in other occasions, if knowledge is not shared, uh, it's lost. So a culture that is adapted to the local level really depends on the specific place, but it also needs to be shared in dialogue with a new knowledge that is being generated through the current processes and through technology, a technology that was present in your presentation, too. We need to consider what is the role to be played by technologies in that dialogue, that exchange of know-hows and how we can have technologies that actually are adapted to meet our real needs. And well, those were the ideas that I was uh, thinking of, uh, the relationship between the city and the farmlands, uh, cultural change, uh, public policies, community management, and uh, basically how to generate and share knowledge and how to continue to work as part of a network. Yeah. Um, well, I agree with all of that. Um, those are, I mean, that was a whole other lecture, wasn't it, basically? Um, you know, this is why I love food, by the way, as a medium for thinking, because it touches everything, and I think you just absolutely demonstrated that. Um, for me, it all comes, I'm just going to take this off. It comes down to the question of what a good life actually looks like. Now, we've inherited a good life, um, from another era completely. Um, the, the, our idea of a good life is 20th century, and it's got a bit of 19th century in it. Um, but it's got very little kind of from our hunter-gatherer past, ironically. And I think, I mean, funnily enough, I had a, I mean, <laughs> believe it or not, I actually had more slides in my lecture, but I, when I, Coy said, oh, 45 minutes, not an hour, I took quite a lot out. 
Um, you'll be happy to hear. But one of them was directly addressing this question of, okay, what actually do we need to thrive as human beings? And I think under lockdown, I think COVID was an incredibly interesting period, as many crises are, for reassessing what we actually need. And I mean, for me, I mean, I, th I, don't, I'm sh I don't know whether all of your experiences will concur with this, but you know, apart from the absolute horror of losing people we love, which is obviously off the scale, but in terms of those of us who didn't actually get horror, really badly sick or lose someone close to us, the main suffering during COVID was A, not being able to see people, we love and hug them. Obviously, Boris Johnson was doing all of that <laughs> for discovering, but sorry, I keep bringing him up because basically I just want to... <laughs> um, and access to nature. And I think in a city like Madrid, this will have been quite a big thing because people were locked up in their tiny little apartments. And you start, as a human, you just start feeling sick if you can't get contact to nature or see a tree or anything green. And interestingly, those, as I say, are the fundamental things, if you think about it, that we've split into by, by, by living in cities, to put it very, very basically. But there's other things as well. So if you look at the way hunter-gatherers organize their lives and what they naturally have, I mentioned right at the beginning the very, very healthy microbiome, so incredibly good health. They have incredibly high levels of agency and skill. So every hunter-gatherer knows how to do everything basically a hunter-gatherer needs to know. You know, they have incredible knowledge of the natural world. They can all make bows and arrows. They all know how to hunt for things under the ground, what berries you can eat, what berries you can't eat. They're incredibly highly skilled, highly knowledgeable, and their skill and knowledge is ideally adapted to their environment. So they have incredibly high levels of personal agency, but also political agency because they live in small groups, where, and which is why I spent 35 minutes talking about my slide, where they're sitting around the fire. But, you know, we still respond to that in the same way. If we find ourselves in a group, you know, like-minded group of people and we're sharing food or we're sitting around a fire telling stories, something very primal happens in us. It's like we remember who we really are because we are still biologically, we're still hunter-gatherers. So those same moments are what resonate with us. And so a sense of home, a sense of place, a sense of belonging, high levels of agency, good health, you know, a, a sort of close-knit society, access to nature, these are still the things we need in order to thrive. It's just that we are steadily eradicating all of them in the name of this other weird good life over here, you know, invented by capitalism and industrialization. Oh, I mean, time is another one, by the way, I mean, which has obviously already been a theme tonight, even though I didn't mention it, because uh, I took too much of it. But, um, you know, Benjamin Franklin, who's one of the fathers of capitalism, famously said, time is money. I mean, this is one of the most pernicious sentences ever uttered by a human. Time is not money. Time is life, you know. But we live in a world in which time is considered to be money. Many hunter-gatherers, as well as not having a concept of work, they don't have a concept of time either in the way we would understand it. They don't have watches. They don't go, oh, sorry, I was so fascinating, but I've got to be over here now. No, they live in time. And again, under lockdown, the positive things that people discovered were, one, time. If you had the capacity to use it. So people like me, you know, surrounded by books, you know, I love cooking, you know, I, 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 I'm thinking my, I, I'm sort of, I'm very self-sufficient because I am a writer, so I can be on my own. I loved lockdown, you know, because I just finally had enough time to bake bread and write books and everything, you know, and this has become a cliche that, you know, middle class people in nice houses had a good lockdown, you know, poor, poorer people living in tiny little shoeboxes had a horrible lockdown and obviously key workers who had to risk their lives for the rest of us had the worst lockdowns of all. So, because they didn't have a lockdown, but they had to be out and about risking their lives. And my vision, I guess, is that the only reason that we say that, you know, highly educated, highly skilled people living in nice places with a garden who can bake bread, write books, mend furniture, you know, look after another human being, i.e. they're a doctor or, you know, write complicated legal, whatever it is, have high levels of skill, 
that's what life should be like for everybody. And, and, and this, is, this is my vision. So my vision is that what, what's staring us in the face in, in a way, and food is only the, the most obvious representation of this, is that the most valuable thing in our lives we expect to be cheap. This is insane. This is a sort of symbol that our value system is on its head. And if we focused, instead of saying, oh, everyone has to have a new car every three years and then three holidays you know, in the Maldives, which obviously isn't going to exist in 20 years anyway, but, you know... I mean, I did fly here, and I apologize in a way for that, but actually, Coyce is very, very keen on getting me actually as a human in the room. And I do, you know, I do see there is a huge value in being physically present in a space as well. But if we focused on, you know, rethinking the landscape so that more people have access both to society and nature, and that's why I'm very interested in those models, rethinking society around the idea that everybody eats well and everything that implies, and it's a revolutionary idea, by the way. I mean, you can't get to where I'm talking about without tax reform and land reform, and we need tax reform and land reform. Mm -hmm. uh, they're the two twin elephants in the room. But as you say, you know, bringing back ideas about common ownership, and I'm very, very interested in that. And one of the reasons I'm very interested in the Garden City model, which I barely talked about because I was already very behind by that point, is that the two key influences on that model. One was the anarchists, mm -hmm. interestingly, and, and uh, specifically uh, Peter Kropotkin, who wrote a fascinating book about called Fields, Factories and Workshops, in which he reimagined the landscape, not as cities over here and country over here, but more of a patchwork, you know, where there's more urban infrastructure and possibility in the countryside, but there's also more countryside in the city. You know, so as an individual, and in a way, I think the idea of the 15-minute city very much feeds into this. You know, you have everything, which, by the way, is getting very politicised in the UK, but let's not go there. But, you know, the idea that, you know, an average person has the basic things they need for good life within a 15-minute bike ride, you know, it makes a lot of sense to me. But it's a complete reimagination of everything. But critically, here's the crunch replacing the thing that capitalism needs in order to keep going, which is consumerism, with, product, with, being a create, with being a creator, everyone being able, being skilled enough to make stuff, to mend stuff, to do stuff, to get their pleasure from the things that actually really give us pleasure. And that's why I'm so fascinated by that. You know, I, sorry, so I'm just imagining the slide, but you can't see it. But you know, <laughs> the difference between the guy who invented Soylent you know, whether a good life is about using tech to hack life. I mean, that term, hacking life. So you, you use super tech, so we're free of everything, and we can just wander around kind of listening to music and going for a run. It's not a good life at all. It's a fake good life. A good life is one where you, as you say, you, you care for people around you. you, you cook for them, you work with them, you invent things together, you have amazing conversations and so on. They are the pleasures of our hunter-gatherer past that we've got rid of. And so the vision is that that is what we try to build the new society around. Education, skills, strong communities, localism, not at the exclusion of globalism, but, but you know, that classic thing of, you know, think global, act local, and all the rest of it. And absolutely... So, so I mentioned one of the... Um, so the anarchism is very interesting because it brings into... Um, into play the whole question of who gets to own what and the fact that we should collectively own. And the other very important influence on the Garden City was Henry George, who was a, an American economist. And he had this, I think, very interesting model of what's called land value tax, which is basically the premise is that we all own everything together. And this is obviously a very anarchist idea as well. But obviously, you know, La Casa and Dendida needs this building to do its stuff in, and a farmer over there needs a bit of land to farm on. So how do we make that work? Well, La Casa Estendida, which I'm probably saying wrong, pays a rent to the community, and the farmer pays a rent to the community, but the rent is adjusted according to the actual value of the, of the enterprise. So actually, notoriously, as we know, farmers barely earn anything. So actually, the value of farmland, if it's going to stay farmland, is close to zero. So actually, it doesn't really affect the farmer at all. Casa Escondida, you know, it would have that tax to pay, but it, all the other taxes would go away because it's actually then saying that all the wealth in society is held in land. 
and in property. It's, just, it, it's a very, very interesting model is all I'm saying. But as I say, we can't get, I mean, my vision of building a society in which everybody eats well and everything that implies, it requires tax reform and land reform. And, and it's the extent to which people are becoming more willing to talk about those things that it becomes more possible. And it, we have to talk about it. We need it. Yeah. Because, for example, I'm arguing that food gets more expensive. Oh, no, no, uh, sorry. Let me rephrase that. I'm arguing that the true cost of food is embedded in the food that you buy. This means that cheap food would get more expensive in a shop, but it wouldn't get more expensive to society because it's actually killing us and killing the planet. So it's not cheap. It just We've des designed things so it appears cheap. That means that the good food, you know, like, like you know, Kois is producing on his farms and so on, the local, the organic, the artisanal, the one that builds community and so on, seems expensive because it's not competing on a level playing field because all the embedded costs of that food are already in the food. Mm -hmm. So all food would cost that much, basically. Now, you can't condemn a fifth of society to not be able to eat, because we have capitalist societies in which all the wealth flows up to the top, as I think everyone in this room probably has worked out by now. Um, so to move to my model, where the value in society is embedded in food, we have to redistribute wealth to allow everyone to eat well. And, and so it becomes a revolutionary idea, basically. <laughs> it is a revolutionary idea. Hmm. But you can do it gently. You know, it doesn't have to be pitchfork revolution. It can be. <laughs> and of course, you know, Spain is the home of anarchy. I mean, you know, you had. Yeah. You, you, you have those anarchic, well, uh, not anarchic, but anarchist, <laughs> you know, communes in the south. Mm. And of course, Barcelona was famously run on anarchist yeah. principles for, I think, uh, you know, n probably no longer than a year. Yeah during the Spanish Civil War, and so on. So, I mean, <laughs> it, it's an interesting place to be having that conversation. In fact, I'm very, very interested to know what you, as Spanish people, think of all of those kinds of ideas. So, uh, you probably raised a lot more things than I answered, but, but that's my response <laughs> to what you said. <laughs> Pues, si queréis, pasamos a hacer una... Well, if that's all right with you, we could maybe have a bit of a Q&A now. And if the audience has any questions, we could give them the floor and we could uh, thank Carolyn for... We could thank Carolyn for uh, talking about anarchists and referring to them because some of us, I'm sure, are happy to welcome that idea. And I don't know if there's a microphone, a roaming mic, so that we can record the questions as well. I, I was I didn't arrive here on time and I don't know if you talked about it earlier but I wanted to thank I wanted to ask if you do have an opinion with regards to the vertical farms what do you think about vertical farms mm. yeah sorry I um I, I kind of realized when I was putting my slides together that I probably should have a picture of a vertical farm but actually to me a vertical farm, it's just an extension of the, what I was talking about already, which is basically that we need to bring food production back into the city. But, but, but to the extent that a city can feed itself, which is limited, so as you probably know, vertical farms work... Um, well, they work in different contexts. So at the moment, they're mostly growing fruit and vegetables. That's not an accident because historically that was what used to grow in the, in the periphery of a city. They, they are high, growing high-value foods where there's a huge uh, sort of cost advantage to being able to get them very rapidly from the vertical farm to the shop. And that, I mean, in fact, there was a, an example of a, of a very interesting to me example of a, um, a series of supermarkets in Germany where they, they've got sort of, um, they're having greenhouses on the roof. So it's not a vertical farm, actually, it's just a greenhouse. Um, but they're also making the supermarkets hubs for local food. So it's starting to be quite interesting in terms of rethinking the, the, the sort of the local food system. I mean, the, the, there are good and bad things about vertical farms. The good thing is that they, as you probably know, they use very little water. They don't use any pesticides because they keep the pests out. Um, they, they're... Um, I mean, th there's a sort of question to me over the nutritional value because it depends, obviously, on what they're growing the plants in. So it, it could be great. Uh, in other words, when you grow plants organically in living soil, you know that that complexity that we know we don't understand is there. 
when you're feeding plants on a, a liquid a chemical mix you've produced, then the only nutrient, nutrients you're getting is what is already there. So we're trying to play God in that sense as humans. But of course, we're already doing that in greenhouses anyway, so big difference. My other problem is um, that they obviously use energy rather than sunshine. Now, again, in parts of the world where there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, um, shall we say, call for food and no land, for example, Singapore, vertical farms are doing really, really well because it's a very rich place that has a food problem and they're willing to pay the energy. In other places, uh, it, the, the economics don't stack up. So, and of course, you know, the, the technology of the light that's shining on the plants is improving all the time, so the, the equation's getting better, but it's still a, an issue. Um, and sometimes I think, you know, the answer is not a vertical farm, probably it's just a greenhouse in, in, a, in the right place, as I say with this German thing, this German project. Um, and the last thing is, of course, again, kind of ownership. So, I mean, I briefly mentioned the whole question of... Um, Sovereignty. When I briefly mentioned, you know, Pavi Vainaka and the, you know, the 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 Soline project, which is kind of you know, very exciting technologically um, about the possibility of creating protein from sunlight and so on. But who's going to own it? Who's going to have the patience? You know, do I really want to be fed by Google? You know, for the rest of my life. And I I think when we're looking for these technological solutions, we always have to ask all the sociological, political questions alongside them. I mean, having said all that, oh, oh and by the way, I mean, you know, the, there are, there are um, plenty of vertical farms that have sort of done very well for three years and then gone out of business. So, I mean, it's sort of, in a way, proving the economic model doesn't always work, including in London. Um, and the ones that do well are growing micro herbs mostly, and they're selling them to high-end restaurants for insane amounts of money. So, so, you know, and that's not to say that you couldn't extend the idea to, and in fact, people are talking about extending it to tomatoes and so on, uh, and they are doing that. Um, but it, there's high embedded cost. If you can't make enough money as a farmer on a bit of land growing food for the, for the city, if you have to build a whole building and shine energy at plants and so on, it, there's always going to be an economic and ecological question. But in certain circumstances, I think they can be part of the answer. That's a complex answer to a complex question. But, hmm. Oh, and one other thing, sorry. I mean, I think one of the, uh, an important thing to say, and this is something that I think relates directly to, to Kois and indeed Naria's work. One of the values of growing food in and near cities is a social one. It's because it reconnects city dwellers to food. And I, Sotopia Farm, where I'm a, a board member, that has had a profound, I mean, it's, it's only existed for two years, but it's really rapidly built up a very, very strong and dedicated group of people who come there. And it's, it, it's fascinating to see how it changes people's mindsets that they're working mm. as farmers. Mm. You can't do that on a vertical farm, or you can, but it's, it, it's more like a laboratory. You know, you have to step in chemicals and wear hair nets and wellingtons and... You know, so it doesn't have the educational value and it doesn't bring city dwellers back in contact with food mm. as powerfully as just growing stuff in a bit of land. It would be the other thing I would say. Yeah. Other than that, they can be part of the solution. Alguna pregunta más por ahí? Any other questions in the room? Hello. Sorry, I also was late, but I wanted to ask if... Um, so what about the tax ref uh, yeah. the tax and the mm -hmm. land property or yeah. whatever change yeah. you want to do? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'm curious about that. Mm. I don't know if you talk about it, sorry. I was really... Well, late. right at the end. So, I mean, if you literally only came in now, you will have missed it. But, I mean, I just, yeah, talked about it. Okay, just, okay, just sorry now. about that. No, that's all right. Yeah, no, no, I mean... Look, this is, this is the basis on which every revolution in history has failed. Um, the problem with revolutions and evolution in general is that people in power quite like the way things are, generally, because they're the ones doing well out of the way things are. So people like, you know, Proudhon. I mean, Proudhon, I find, so Proudhon was the sort of, is the word of the father of the anarchists. And... He wrote an absolutely amazing essay. I don't know whether you know it, but it's called uh, Property is Theft. 
or is it called what is property? I think it's called what is property. What is property? And, and then the, the quote the sentence, the, in the yeah. sentence in yeah. it is property is theft. And it, it's brilliant, brilliant thinking, and I actually think this should be on every school curriculum because, you know, it, what he says is... Oh, it's a brilliant critique of capitalism, but it's also a brilliant critique of communism, actually, and that's, where anarchism, that's what anarchism is, and that's why it's interesting. It sits very intelligently in between those two failed models, shall we say, and I will go as far as to say they're both demonstrably failed models, although they, they seem to be all we've got still. Um, and what he says is that, you know, and I did talk about this earlier, so I'll make this brief, but, you know, basically, if I want to farm a piece of land, I need use of that land. You know, I need to keep other people off it because I need it, but that doesn't mean I have to own it outright. Yeah. Society can own it, and I can pay some kind of notional rent to society in order to have use of it. And he uses the brilliant analogy of a theatre. He says, you know, if you want to go and see a play, you just need the use of 30 seat, row 30, seat A for three hours. You don't need to own the theatre, you know. And I think that's, that's one wonderful idea. So it's about notionally society owning land, and then people who want exclusive use of it paying some kind of rent. And that's why I was mentioning, were you here when I talked about Henry George? Uh, okay, you literally just parachuted <laughs> right. in right at the end. But I mean, Henry George was this American economist who came up with this idea of what he called a land value tax. And the way that works is that, again, it's exactly that principle that the farmer pays society for the land, but the amount he pays is based on constantly adjusted valuations of the value of the land. Now, farms aren't worth much, as we know, because farmers can barely earn a living. So the farmer would actually, in practice, probably pay nothing. Whereas if I own a kind of a big office block in the middle of Madrid, and I want that for myself, I'm going to pay society a few million euros a year because it's a very valuable entity and I'm making a lot of profit. So it's a way of putting the way wealth is shared. And, of course, most of society's wealth resides in land. And, I mean, this gets into sort of very deep kind of economic conversations. But, but the problem that we've got, and, and, and by the way, there's literally hundreds of years of philosophers and political thinkers talking about this problem, is that way back in the past there was quite a lot of land around, and it was perfectly possible to just kind of take a boat to America and well, ignore the Native Americans who already there, and say, this enormous bit of land is mine. And everyone went, great, because you know, they'd get the bit next door. And actually, John Locke, who's you know, one of the key philosophers of, of capitalism and, and of liberal democracy that sort of comes out of that, he argues that that's fine as long as you don't take more land than you need to feed yourself. You know, so that's the way of limiting private property. The problem with that is, of course, that actually it's never been enforced. So we've now got a system where most of the world is owned by people who have got it historically and they don't want to give it up. So this is where a mechanism like a land value tax could play a part because it's a way of gradually over time, what it does is it reduces all land values to, to a sort of common level, interestingly. Yeah. Uh, so it's a very, very interesting model, I think. And it, it's actually potentially non-revolutionary, but with a revolutionary outcome. If you allow me to make a comment of, of that, I love the idea of a stewardship of the land instead of ownership. Mm. Like, uh, if you really think mm. about that, we don't really own things that we don't carry with ourselves. Yeah, yeah. We just manage them. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like, I can't own a building because it's there. I yes. don't wear it or, or take it with me. It's, exactly. I just, yes. at the, time, the period of time that I'm alive, yes. I can take care of it. Yes. And then afterwards, someone else will do. So it's like, in yes. my lifetime, I just take care of the land. Exactly. It's, it's where it was way before and it's going to be way after. And, and that's part of the thinking that both Henry George and actually, interestingly, Peter Kropotkin in his other book that I didn't mention, Conquest of Bread, mm -hmm. talks about, is that all of this wealth around us, we didn't create it. Exactly. We inherited it. Exactly. And that's, that's part of the thinking, very much part of the thinking. So I think if you're interested in these things and you don't know these books, I would read Henry George's Progress and Poverty, 
and I would read uh, Kropotkin's Conquest of Bread. Right. Those are the two books that would directly address Owen Proudhon's <laughs> yeah, What yeah. is Property. Mm. Thanks. And they're all they're, they blow your mind. They're all amazing books or essays. I, I guess. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Carmen. Um, thank you for being here. And um, I'm sorry, Carolyn. And my question is going to be a bit naive, I'm afraid. But I wanted to ask you, to the three of you, if you have any hope, if you have hope in this changing, do you think that we will have a capacity Thanks to this micro examples, I don't know if local examples, but um, neighbors uniting, because I think that here during the pandemic, we saw some examples of what communities could do, what neighborhoods could do, what locally we could do by organizing ourselves to be able to feed the people who needed to be fed. And, and actually, it's what we're saying, right? Because for that change to actually happen, we need to end this food system. We have to reform the economic system. And that can only be done if, if those who govern us want to change, have that, that willingness to change. And they obviously don't have it. So you individually, with day-to-day -day things that you do, that you see, do you have that hope? Do you really think that man man as in men and women could go back to that hunter, um, hunter, collector, um, gatherer role that is more linked to nature? Or, or do you think that technology will be the answer? Um, we don't know what the question is. That's actually my question. That's what I wanted to ask you. Is there any hope? Um, there's certainly hope. And technolo technology is, is never the answer. Technology it can enable you to work towards the answer that you otherwise arrive at. And, and it's very important to remember that because I think, you know, and that's why I love that quote so much, you know, because technology is very, um, and sorry, I just started talking because I just had to address mm -hmm. this, but, um, you know, technology is very seductive. And, and if you look at the evolution of our technology, it's, a, it's what's known as a hockey stick curve. You know, so as I say, we invented, we learned how to control fire one and a half million years ago, perhaps. You know, we started living in, started farming 12,000 years ago. We started living in cities 5,000 years ago. We started using fossil fuels 250 years ago. We invented the internet 50 years ago. You know, we're now going into AI at a sort of warp speed. And it's terrifying and it's very seductive. And, and that's why I talk quite a lot about it and why I, Bring, oh, sorry, in my head I've got my slides still up and I'm pointing to them, but you'll just see why she's waving her arm around. But you know, why I compare Rob Reinhardt, who is this um, complete tech head, you know, in his amazing quote, to worry about something as simple as food in the digital age is weird. I just, I love that because there's nothing simple about food. That's like saying life is simple. It's, it's such a stupid thing to say, but in his head, it says, oh, just create. And by the way, he nearly killed himself about three times when he was doing this because, you know, <laughs> he forgot to put iron in or something. So he's giving up food and, and killing himself, basically. So it, it's very hubristic, you know, of, of humanity to think we can outsmart nature. We are nature. We're part of nature. And, 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 and this is why I get very worried when with, with things like Solene. People get very excited about it. Say, oh, that's the answer. Ah, oh, let's worship that god over there. And you think, but, but that's not the problem we have to face. The problem we have to face is messier, it's more human, it's more compromised, it's, more, it's always going to be much, much more diverse. You know, we have to learn, the question we have to ask is, what is a good life? And then we have to say, what technologies could help us lead this good life? I'm not saying going back to being a hunter-gatherer, that would be completely ludicrous. And as I said at the beginning, actually the, the world was only supporting about 10 million people at the time that we started farming. But I am saying that we can use technology to help us solve the bigger problem of how we can create good societies, how we can live better lives in the 21st century. And in that respect, I have great hope. And the reason I have great hope is we're running out of road for plan A. You know, and I mean, people have been, I mean, I know a lot of very grumpy 70-year-old, you know, 80-year-old, ecologists 
who've been banging on about this stuff since the 1970s, which is when it really went mainstream that people started worrying about actually climate change, but also our relationship with nature and so on. A lot of the best books I read for my second book, Cytopia, were written in the 1970s. They're very, they're like permaculture, for example, or The Limits to Growth. It's all in the 90s. Or one of the most important books anyone wrote about anything ever, uh, Small is Beautiful, E.F. Schumacher's amazing Schumacher. e e economics book. It's all the 1970s. It's, it's 55 mm. years ago. So we've known this stuff, but nobody's done anything about it because we're all too busy leading, as I sort of described it, this 20th century good life that, oh, you know, I still seem to be able to do this. I'll just carry on then because it's great. Now it's just it, the end of that is coming and things are really changing. And I, I find that very exciting. It, I mean, it's worrying because I think geopolitically we're in a very, very fragile state globally. I mean, Ukraine war, what China's up to, America potentially, you know, goes Republican again. And, you know, I mean, there's, there's a, a, the Middle East. I mean, it just, you know, where do you stop? So um, we live in perilous times, but I do have hope. Because I think, I mean, I keep meeting amazing human beings. You know, I mean, we're still producing amazing human beings. We're just not kind of presenting them with the skills or the education or the opportunity to actually be what they could be. So that's why I'm arguing for this massive change in mindset, which is what we need. Um, but I think it will come. Because I think, it, you know, as I say, crises, and you said very interestingly, Naria, you know, are we having the right kind of crisis? You know, because we're in a crisis, but it's not the kind of crisis that makes people go, ah, there's a tidal wave coming, I'll run that way. But actually, that is how we need to be responding. So, but I think increasingly that will be the case. Um, I just hope we keep our heads because, as I say, the, the, the problem with crises is that people can panic and therefore make the, the wrong decisions. And we need to, we need to remember that, that we, there's no shortcut of the thinking that we have to do. And, and the reordering we have to do. We have to allow the messiness of it and the compromise-ness of it to be... Sorry, is that a the word you can translate? Compromised-ness um, <laughs> of it to be part of our thinking. That's why I'm really suspicious of, oh, the answer is soiling or the answer is protein or algae or whatever else. They may be... Or vertical farming, in fact. People get very, oh, it's vertical farming? Ah, oh, sorted, great. You know, because it, it, it's a mindset that wants a solution, a silver bullet. So I'm a very anti-silver bullet person, but that doesn't make me anti-technology. I'm just arguing for also philosophy, also humanity, also acknowledge the mess. Uh, sorry, that was a long <laughs> answer to you all. But yes, hope. Yes to hope. Tick in the hope box, yeah. Nere? Okay. Sí. I said that I was going through those, those narratives talking about future that people refer to, and I thought that they were thrilling, and some of them were actually plausible. And you think about it and you say, well, things work okay, but I don't know how we're going to get to that point, that futuristic narrative. I am usually pessimistic, but I think that there will be a point where with conflicts and in ways that we cannot fathom right now, we will have a different relationship with nature and, and with other people. A friend of mine, a friend of mine always says that our children, our grandchildren will remind us well, will remember us as that generation that would uh, pilfer, that was anxious, and that had a way of life that was completely absurd. So it's a bit sad to think that we are going to be that memory. But we have the hope of thinking that someone, at some point, with a great um, tipping point change um, disruption, will be able to get out of this vicious this vicious um, cycle. I don't know if it's because of our culture, our momentum, and um, we find it complicated to 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 leap forward, but we will have to do it at some point. So I know I do have that hope, that, that weird optimism, thinking that we will get to that point where everything changes. Keynes would say that the unavoidable doesn't usually happen. It's usually, actually, that, that which is improbable is what happens. And, um, and we say that our hope is always based in 
that which is um, unlikely. It's improbable, but it might happen. Maybe it's not the most likely, but it does happen. And I think that we have some responsibility in that point, those of us here and society in general with regards to the way in which we look at the world. We cannot just look at everything that's bad and negative. We have this, this tendency of always thinking about the worst things about our present when we think about the future, but we find it very difficult to think about the best aspects, the best experiences, the best practices, some of the practices that Carolyn has actually mentioned, and to take that as a basis to, to, con to build some new narratives and some new possibilities. I think that there is some responsibility there. We have to look into the good of our society. And sometimes we say, if I don't see it, I don't believe it. Well, um, if we don't believe in them, we won't see them either. And sometimes things go go on without everyone realizing that there are things going on in in the local, in the neighborhoods, amongst communities, good things that should somehow crystallize. For instance, during the pandemic, during lockdown, there were loads of solidarity. It was amazing. I think that when there are great crises, like in Rebecca Sonny's um, book, uh, uh, Paradise Built in Hell, I think that sometimes we get the best of us, and I think that there is an element there that um, allows us to to keep on hoping. I think that hope is 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 something that the, you either have or you don't have. It's not something that you can order Amazon to to deliver. Could you please send me a sliver of hope? No, hope is built as we get involved in things, as we get involved in collective dynamics, if we decide to challenge ourselves personally, to change our lifestyle, to do those things that we know we have to do, maybe it's unpopular, maybe it's more difficult, maybe it's more costly, but we know we have to do it. Well, it's about getting committed and, and helping, um, helping each other and having other people support us, believing in us and making make us feel that this is not insignificant, that it's important what we're doing. Uh, something that allows us to get more momentum so that we can really have an impact around us. And I think that that's a capacity that we have, but we don't recognize. And my hope is about that, about involving other people, about being engaged to be part of the change. Because the more we are part of this change, the easier it is and the more believable change is. And generally, we think that change will happen when we're involved. And I think that that is also part of what we have to do. We have to try and... and and, and believe in social change, know that, that we don't have to understand everything and learn a lot to take a step. Sometimes what we need is to start walking, and then we will rationalize what it is that we're doing, and we will understand what our changes are. So this is a call for action, really. I think that hope will be found um, if we start being part of it, being part of that change that we need. And, and one last question, because it's a bit late now. I think that you were raising your hand, so maybe. Thank you very much for a, an amazing presentation. I think it's been very enlightening, personally, for, for me. Um, I wanted to, to ask you a little bit more about the real cost of food, mm. which um, obviously is very linked to that tax reform mm. that you were mentioning mm. about. and. Um, I personally started a, a vertical farm five years ago, so mm. you know, I'm one and of the bad ones. And you're doing right. <laughs> you're still <laughs> in was, business. I am, yes. Yeah, yeah. yes. I'm not growing leafy greens like I was. Oh. I'm growing hops for okay. the beer industry. Amazing. Because yeah. hops is uh, yeah. under very severe climate change, yeah. so um, we're looking at something that already has a very direct yeah, market. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it was a way, I mean, we got into it as a way of trying to contribute to fix mm. the food system mm. by having food stop traveling thousands of miles and yeah. just have the, the knowledge and the technology to grow it there where the market is, right? Instead of reforming everything, well, how can you use that knowledge to, to help bring it about? But the truth is, I think many uh, vertical farms actually go out of business because you're comparing a vertical farming produced uh, lettuce yeah. that incorporates all the costs yeah. compared yeah. to, not to the local garden that uses organic, mm. but rather to the industrial farm where, mm. yeah. you know, who's paying for the uh, uh, underground waters that exactly. are completely contaminated? Yeah. Yeah. Who's paying yeah. for the health impact on that? Who's exactly. paying for exactly. all those other things that are yeah. not paid for by a lettuce at 50 cents yeah. a all, head? We're all paying. Right? All so, paying. Yeah. you know, I think yeah. 
uh, vertical farming in that sense is a way of internalizing all those costs. Yes, yeah. you have a high yeah, energy yeah. cost, but yeah. if you produce it with solar panels, yeah. it's not really a high energy cost, but yeah. Yeah. it's a higher cost of food. Yeah. And yeah. can everybody afford a lettuce yeah. at three euros instead yeah. of at 50 cents? Yeah. No, so there go the tax reform. I think, uh, I think that's, that's a bit the, the um, sort of the catch-22 situation, yeah, I you mean, know? Yeah, I mean, we can't get... To what, no, thank you so much. And that's really, really interesting to hear about your vertical farm. I'm, I'm very glad to hear about that. And as I say, I mean, I th think the technology is improving all the time, which is making it more possible. And it's very interesting that you found a very niche market and, and you were addressing a very specific problem. So, again, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, what I... I mean, there's a... I, True cost accounting in food, which is what I'm really talking about, is um, a very simple idea with very, very complex kind of um, mechanisms that would have to go into place in order for it to work. But it is, tr and, and you're asking exactly the right questions. If, you know, if a 50p le lettuce, or cent lettuce, I should say, since I'm in Spain, and of course we can't get lettuces in the UK because of B-R-E-X-I-T, which I try not to talk about because I get very, very cross. Um, but, you know, the society is paying the true cost of that lettuce, and it's everything, as you rightly say, from water depletion. It's, all, it's that slide I had up. You know, it's everything from diet-related disease to uh, habitat destruction to climate change to water depletion to soil depletion to loss of biodiversity, all of it. And it's an unaffordable cost that we're paying. But we're choosing to pay it um, because we've got addicted to this idea of cheap food. And our entire society is built around the existence of this non-existent thing called cheap food. And that is the problem. Now, if you're going to... So I can take that off because I'm waving my arms around. So I can hear my own voice coming back at me through my ears. quite odd. Um, just only just realised, however, so that tells you what state I'm in. Um, the, 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 the problem is... And, and, and uh, the problem that the opportunity is that... Um, you know, in order to go to my dream of a society where there is no, there's no food that's, you know, involves animal cruelty or, you know, the kind of the level that sort of large-scale industrial farming does that doesn't pollute, that isn't a sort of overusing resources like water, that doesn't involve human slavery, that doesn't involve sort of pushing indigenous farmers off their land, that doesn't involve cutting down rainforest and 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 and. and. Um, that is going to require us to completely restructure our politics, our economics, our idea of a good life. But that is my proposal. Uh, because, so what I, uh, what I want to go from is this extractive, consumerist, dead-end capitalist model to a model which is about common ownership and it's about basing our values back in what is actually valuable and food is just the most obvious example of that. I mean, in fact, it is the prime example because we all have to eat every day so i can't think of a better place to put it and that's why again i'm so fascinated by you know the the, the, the sort of the idea of the hunter gatherer economy because it's based around what's actually valuable so so then how do we do the share well okay how do we do the paying cost bit well some of it's obvious because you know at the moment in the uk we have a crazy situation where we have farmers Farming with chemicals, they pull far too much chemical on the land, the chemicals goes in the river, it kills the river, or they've got huge chicken farms, they just let all the chicken shit out, the chicken goes into the river, they pollute, nobody does anything about it. They get these pathetic little fines, there's no regis leg legislation against it, etc., etc. Clearly you can't get where I'm talking to unless you say polluter pays. Clearly you can't get where I'm talking to unless you say... We have incredibly powerful environmental rules in, in, in place that means you can't cut down that forest over there. You can't sort of denude that soil. You can't suck water out of somebody else's water source, etc. It's a global problem. I think Naria raised it briefly when you were talking about, you know, the sort of a new ecological awareness that has to become legally based. You know, we need new legal contracts to do with our relationship with each other and with nature that are just much, much more powerful than what we've got at the moment. It's going to be very difficult to win a sort of a, a, where geopolitically where we are. Um, and the interesting thing about China is that, you know, they're very aware of this stuff. I mean, you know, we don't like everything they do by a long way, but they're very, very aware of the environmental issues. And they're actually very quick to act when they decide something needs to be done. So... 
part of, I mean, you know, part of our problem is that we've got so used to leaving everything to the market, basically, you know, and the market just will solve none of this. I mean, market plus very, very strict regulation can begin to solve it, and, you know, but, but it's, it's how you put those mechanisms in place, and, and, and that requires political will. So you're absolutely right. It's not just, okay, oh, brilliant, we'll just do that. It's much, much more complicated. But I think, as I say, the severity of the problems we're facing now is sort of, you know, even crazy governments like the UK are going to have to kind of start facing up to this stuff because it, it's just becoming unsustainable the way we're doing it now. But in my world, your, your hops would, would be in a, in a level playing field and they'd, they'd be doing fine. And I'm glad to hear they're doing pretty well anyway. But thank you very much for the question. It's important. Mm. So not, not easy, but doable. And indeed necessary. I would, yeah. Bueno, pues vamos a ir cerrando, que se nos ha ido el tiempo más de lo pensado. Okay, so we'll be finishing now because we have been here longer than expected. We wanted to thank you for bearing with us until the end. And since we will continue with this cycle tomorrow, uh, Sark Rosa will be here, Marta Pascual, and we will also be talking about these things that have to do with uh, thinking narratives, utopias, and in this case, we will be talking about the role that art could have in, in all of this and what culture could do, and especially authors and novelists such as Isaac. So thank you so much. And if uh, you wish to come tomorrow, we'll be here waiting for you.